Audio's good? Everybody good? good? Finally good? Okay, yes. great. <laughs> Thanks a lot for bearing with us, folks. Uh, as I've been saying, we've had a few technical difficulties just because I changed my setup here tonight, just so I can show you what I'm gonna show you here. So uh, thanks for bearing with us as, we, as we've been getting this together and making everything work. Uh, still, we're looking for your questions, of course. And if during the program, uh, for any reason, you notice anything technically odd, like you can't see me or you can't hear me or something, if you please just let us know in the chat, that would be very helpful. And then that way we can confirm that the signal's getting out to you too. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Uh, you can also use that chat function for questions. Okay, well, if we've got everything, then let's get rolling. All right, super. All right, good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, the chief astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer, welcoming you to yet another edition of Night Skies at Home. Night Skies at Home is the extension of our Franklin Institute program, Night Skies at the Observatory, that we've been doing at home since the pandemic began. It's been a challenge for us, mostly because of the fact that we haven't been able to have the museum, the observatory open, uh, for our evening programs. And so because we haven't been able to do that, that's uh, made it difficult for us to do the evening programs. But we've come to you uh, in this virtual fashion, uh, extending things to you at home because sky observing is a wonderful thing to do from home, even during the pandemic. Of course, this uh, allows you to use social distancing if you're at home with your family bubble, you don't have to wear a mask to be out in your backyard or on your front stoop looking up at the night skies. And this, of course, is something that can be done by everybody everywhere because it doesn't really require equipment. Although we're going to talk equipment tonight, it typically doesn't require equipment for looking at the night sky. So again, welcome everybody. Night skies at home. This is the April 2021 edition. And uh, you know, actually, this reminds me that we've been doing this now for about a year. So if any of you were with us when we first started out doing this uh, way back in April of last year and you're still with us, thank you so very much for your dedication and hanging in there with us. Uh, it's really, really wonderful that you've been able to stick with us through this program and we hope, we hope that the information that you've learned here has been really helpful. Okay, so uh, thanks a lot for being here again. It's been a full year since we started doing this. Okay, so let's get on with our program because we have quite a bit to do. Let's start out first with the general information that we always go through for this program, just so you understand. We really want you to become a regular sky watcher. If you'd like to become an amateur astronomer and get all the way into it, that's great. But what we really wanna do is just connect you with the night sky. And when I say connect you with the night sky, what I mean is, I really want you to have enough of a working knowledge of the sky so that when you go outside on any clear night, you're able to identify the planets that are available and you'll be able to identify at least the bright stars of the sky, the bright constellations of the sky, and maybe a few other objects besides that. For example, some satellites. So that's the kind of information we wanna make sure you have. And we'd also like to encourage you to share that with your family and friends, because it's really fun information to have on hand when you're outside in the evening. It makes any time in the evening sky more enjoyable just because you can connect with the night sky and you can see and enjoy some of what's up there. Okay, all right, great. So probably the most important message I can give you tonight still is when you're out in public, wear a mask. We still have a ways to go with COVID-19. And even though we're all getting vaccinated now, that's really wonderful. We still need you to wear your mask and make sure you do get vaccinated. The science works, okay? So don't forget that. This month, what we're gonna do is we're gonna work our way through a complete review of every part of a telescope. Your telescope, perhaps the kind of telescope that you received for a holiday gift this past holiday season, or you might have it home in a closet and you'd like to pull it out and start using it. April, of course, brings us the next observing season for the year through the late spring and into the summer and into the fall. And if you have a telescope, you really ought to get out and use it. While it might look complicated, it isn't really that complex. And I want you to have a working understanding of how it works so that you can use it easily to your benefit to get a better look at what's available in the night sky. So tonight, I'm gonna to tell you what it does, what the part does, 
I'm going to tell you how it works, and I'm going to help you understand what to do with it so you can use your telescope better. All right. Now, another bit of really interesting news is April 8th, next Wednesday. Next Wednesday, the helicopter on Mars, Ingenuity, will take its trial flight. It's scheduled to fly on that day, April 8th. This is the helicopter that was taken to Mars on board the Perseverance rover that landed just last month, about two months ago now, and it'll be the first time an aircraft has ever flown on another planet. Now, you can follow this at nasa.gov slash perseverance. If you go to the NASA website, look for the Perseverance rover webpage, you can get all the information you need to know about the helicopter that's been named Ingenuity. And Ingenuity is going to fly, scheduled to fly, next Wednesday, April 8th. Don't forget that. It's going to be a historic mission just to have this helicopter fly on Mars. And here's the coolest thing about this. You ready? Attached to the helicopter is a postage stamped sized piece of fabric from the original Wright Brothers flyer that flew way back at the beginning of the 20th century as the first powered aircraft. How cool is that? It's amazing. So a piece of that aircraft is actually on the planet Mars about to have probably maybe the next most significant flight in aviation history since the Wright brothers. Very, very cool indeed. So you don't wanna miss that. Okay, so that's coming up. Uh, we're also gonna talk a little bit this evening about this SpaceX flight test program. Uh, if you have been paying any attention to this at all, you know that every four weeks or so, SpaceX has been doing a flight test of their next big launch vehicle that they call Starship. But I think every one of the last four tests has ended in a crash when it returns to land. But we want to talk about the flight test program because this is really interesting, but we're getting to see, so they say, or the way you say it is, we're getting to see how the sausage is made. Right. Nobody wants to know how the sausage is made. Everybody loves to eat the sausage, but nobody wants to see how the sausage is made. Well, guess what? SpaceX is allowing us to see how the sausage is made. And that includes the best of the test flights and the crashes afterwards, all in an effort to help us understand how that program works. And of course, we want your questions. We want your questions. So if your questions are about astronomical objects in the night sky, that's great. But if your questions about, are about telescopes, send them on so we can talk about them tonight while we talk about telescopes. Okay, so let's go on with the phenomenon of the night sky, and then we're going to jump right into how these telescopes work, okay? All right, so sunrise now. Sunrise is coming now at 6.42 a.m., 6.42 a.m., right? And sunset is coming at 7.26 p.m. So now the days are getting longer. It was not too long ago that sunrise was coming at 7 o'clock in the morning, but now that time is going backwards, so the sun is rising earlier and earlier. Sunsets are now coming closer to 7.30 p.m. And that's gonna continue now as we make our way forward into spring and on towards summer. The next cross quarter day, the halfway point between the first day of spring and the first day of summer is coming up on May 1st, May Day. You all know these cross quarter days. Let me just remind you of them. May Day is one, so you know that one. I'll bet many people don't know the one that's halfway between the first day of summer and the first day of fall. That one is called Lamas, L-A-M-M-A-S. Lamas is an agriculturally related cross-quarter day. It's a day that's meant to mark when farmers, ancient farmers of a long time ago, would begin to prepare for the upcoming harvest season that was coming just after the first day of fall in September, right? But here's one you definitely know the one that's halfway between the first day of fall and the first day of winter. You all know this one, you could almost guess it. I'll give you a hint, the date is October 31st. Yeah, that's right, it's Halloween. Halloween is a cross quarter day. It's again, a very important day on the calendar because it describes that halfway point between the two, but it's also connected to all sorts of mysterious, macabre, odd, fun things like that, now fun things but that's an important day on the calendar as well, okay? So how about the one that's the first day or the 
the day that's halfway between the first day of winter and the first day of spring, you all know this one too, February 2nd, Groundhog Day. Now, these cross quarter days, halfway between the first days of the season, are meant to provide an agricultural society with ways to break down the calendar year and connect these dates to agriculture so that they can plan better, schedule better for planting and harvesting crops. Now, if you're a society that's wholly dependent on the success of your crops being planted at the proper time so that they mature at the proper time so that you can harvest them at the proper time and store them properly so you can get through the worst part of the year, the winter in the Northern Hemisphere, then these cross quarter days become very important to you and ways to divide the year so that you can keep track of all this is very important to you. Now, today, of course, we do very, very high level manufacturing for all of our food stuff, so we don't pay as much attention to that as we used to. But farmers still do around the world pay attention to these days, okay? So that's what those cross quarter days are. All right, so the moon today, it's a waning gibbous phase moon. We're coming up on last quarter moon. This Sunday, Easter Sunday, will be the last quarter moon. Last Sunday, Palm Sunday, was full moon around the Philadelphia area. Of course, we couldn't see it because the weather wasn't so great, but last quarter moon is coming up on Easter Sunday. And then the new moon follows on April 11th, which is around the following Sunday, okay? So we have this new phase beginning April 11th, and then you can follow the moon on through its next phase. Cool thing about understanding how the telescopes work is that you'll be ready and set up for when the moon begins its next phase starting April 11th. And you can use your telescope to follow the moon through its phases right through to full, and you'll be able to see this glorious wonder in your telescope under high magnification. Works great, good way to do that. All right, the other thing that's available in the evening sky for you to look at with your telescope or binoculars is the planet Mars. You can even see it naked eye. It's high in the Western sky, so you'll be able to catch that uh, not far from, uh, I'm trying to visualize how to say how, this, how, how you'll find it. It's actually quite simple to find because it's just above the bright red star in the constellation Taurus the Bull. That's the star Aldebaran. And so you'll be able to see it in the evening sky. And you'll be able to tell the difference between the two. Aldebaran is red, Mars is red, stars twinkle, planets don't. Simplest way to help you figure out which ones are stars and which ones are planets so you can catch that. So Mars, high in the west, after dark in the evening. So right about now, you should be able to catch it without too much difficulty. A number of constellations available to us this time of year that work out really great for us. We can still see the winter constellations, the winter circle of stars over on the western side of the sky. We can still see those. If you see me pointing in this direction, uh, here we are at Shea Pitts. We're in the TV room and west for me is over in this direction. So immediately when I think of direction, I go point in that direction. So for me, it's over in this direction. For you, it's the direction of the sky where the sky is, it's the direction in which you still see some glow from the sun on the horizon at this time of evening, that's west for you. So keep that in mind because that's very helpful. So all those winter constellations, Orion, Taurus, Gemini, Auriga, Canis Major, Canis Minor, they're all over there still visible for another hour or two before they set. And there's some great things to see in a telescope looking in that direction. But then coming up over here in the east, we have the spring circle of constellations. Now that includes Gemini as one that's shared between the winter circle and the spring circle, but Gemini takes us right over to Leo the lion, which then connects us to Ursa Major, the big bear, and Ursa Minor, the little bear. We can use those to get ourselves down to Buotes the herdsman, where there's another red giant star called Arcturus, and then we can use that group of stars to take us down to Virgo one of the main constellations of the zodiac group and the bright star Spica. So we have that nice circle that we can get that way too. So that's pretty cool. So these are the constellations that are available in the sky. You're gonna be able to use your telescopes to observe the bright stars in each one of them. But in order for you to do that, you have to understand a little bit about how these telescopes work. So let's get into it. Okay, so. Here we go, folks. Thank you for bearing with me on this as we get this done. It's gonna be a little bit of a challenge just to get everything visible for you where you can see it, but I'm gonna do my best to point out everything to you that you need to know about the telescopes. 
What I'm going to do is I'm going to point out the parts of the telescope for you so that you understand what's where. And I'll tell you how it works, what it does, and how you're going to use it to get the best view you can through your telescope. Okay. Now, we have two types of telescopes here this evening. We have a refracting telescope over here on this side, a refracting telescope over here. And then on my left over here, we have a reflecting telescope. And I'm going to start with the refracting telescope. This is a very basic kind of telescope that many people may have picked up as a gift during the holiday season. So I'm going to start with this one. Now, this particular one, I'm sorry, this, this particular, I'm just listening to my, to my studio director here telling me what I need to do. Oh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, my studio director is telling me that you can't see my face. You don't need to see my face. Don't worry about that. As long as you can see the scope, that's what's important. Okay, cool, right. So this particular refracting telescope is um, of the variety that we find most often available these days. And that's a telescope that has a power drive, has a motor drive so that it will track and follow objects across the sky. Now, that's typical these days. And the reason why it's typical is because of the fact that the price of the microprocessor and the motors is so low nowadays that you can easily build it into a telescope like this for a reasonable price point. How about that? So just to be completely transparent, a telescope like this, of this size with a motor drive, sells for only about $450. Not bad. And a telescope like this will let you see all the cool stuff you want to see the moon, planets, bright stars, nebulae, depending where you are, if you're under dark skies, you can even see galaxies. And it's totally portable, totally transportable, so that you can take it someplace where the sky is clear and dark. Okay, so now let's get into the basic parts here so that you understand what's what on the telescope. Let's start with the main piece that everybody always looks for. The main piece, of course, is the optics tube. This is the optics tube on this telescope right here. I'm gonna remove it from the base of the telescope just so you can see it a little better and so I can describe it to you a little better. In this particular instance, there's a knob right down here at the bottom. I'll turn this towards you a little bit so you can see it a little bit better. There's a knob right here that I can loosen that will allow me to slide this tube out just like this. And there's the telescope tube, just like that, okay? Now, what's in this? What's going on here? Well, up here is the front end of the telescope where light comes from whatever the object is you're observing. And then down here is what I call the business end of the telescope where you actually look through, okay? So first things first, up here on this end, there's a lens cap. I'm gonna remove that lens cap and I'm gonna put it down here on the accessory tray. And so now we can almost look right down the tube and you can see where the lens is right here on the front end. See where the lens is right there? Hopefully I have it at the right angle. Can you see that pretty well? Okay, great. Now you're looking right down the front end of the telescope. Light comes into the telescope here, travels down the tube and comes to the eyepiece on the far end here, down on this portion right here. Now, just so you know, there's nothing else inside the tube. There's the lens that's right here at the front, and then the eyepiece that's here at the back. In between, this is just an empty tube. What the tube does is it provides a rigid structure to hold this lens in, li in line with the eyepiece on this end. Okay, so that's what that's meant to do. The tube provides a rigid structure to hold this lens in line with the eyepiece back here. And that's really important. You have to keep those two properly aligned. And this tube does just that, okay? So main lens up here at the front is called the objective. If you hear that word, that's the objective lens. The objective lens is typically measured in millimeters of diameter, millimeters of diameter. For this particular telescope, the diameter of the front lens is 60 millimeters, 60 millimeters. Now. That size 
is more than twice the size of the first telescope Galileo ever built, and he could see the moons of Jupiter. So what that means is that you can easily see the moons of Jupiter and the moons of Saturn without too much trouble at all. Okay, all right, great. Now, that's on the front end here. This piece that's on top is called the dew cap, and it just protects the lens from having dew fall on it if you're using it at night. I'm sorry, I don't know. Yeah. Okay, let me just get myself right in here. My floor director is telling me where to stand so that you can get the best view. Okay, good. So that's what's up here on this end. Now let's look at the rest of what's here. So I mentioned that the eyepiece is down here on this end. Let me show you what I've done here just so you understand what's happening. I'm gonna put this back in the mount so I can use both hands. Okay, now let's go down to this end of the telescope. What I've done is I've just removed the eyepiece and along with the eyepiece, I have what's called a diagonal eyepiece mount. And this diagonal eyepiece mount allows me to look through the telescope at objects that are high overhead without breaking my neck because I have to twist to go down and do this. Instead, I can just look comfortably through the eyepiece like this. So this piece is an option that comes with the telescope usually and fits like that. Everybody got that? Okay, now I can use the telescope just like this without the diagonal, but you can see what kind of trouble that would be for me to see through the eyepiece like this. So what I can do instead is add the diagonal. Now what's in here? The only thing that's in here is a prism that reflects light coming this way out through the eyepiece this way. Light comes in this way, light comes out this way. And the way this all fits together is there are some little thumb screws that hold the eyepiece in, and there are little thumb screws that hold the diagonal in. This is a very useful and handy piece to have on a telescope. If you don't have one on your telescope, you can always get one without any difficulty at all. They're not that expensive, so you can find one to use on your telescope. Now, speaking of the eyepieces, there's probably one of the more important pieces of the telescope, the eyepiece itself. Let's talk about the eyepiece for half a second. The eyepiece is nothing more than a magnifying glass. How do I mean a magnifying glass? What do I mean when I say that? Here's what I mean. Light from the object you wanna see comes down the tube of the telescope. Because of the shape of the lens in the front, the light rays all want to bend and come to a point. And that point is right down here. As they cross that point, those light rays then come to the eyepiece. But before they do, right where the, right where the light rays cross, they create a little tiny, tiny, tiny image of what you have the telescope pointed toward. The eyepiece magnifies that point so you can see it. That's how it works, folks. It's that simple. Light comes through the lens, the lens bends the light, collects it together to a bright point. Your magnifying glass, the eyepiece, now magnifies that point. So here's where all the action happens. It's at the eyepiece. If you've lost your eyepieces, you're not gonna be able to see anything through your telescope, but you can replace the eyepieces. They're easy to get, they're not expensive, and they'll fit your telescope because they're universally sized. So you don't have to worry, you just have to get the right size one. Now, when you're working with eyepieces, here's an important thing to consider. An important thing to consider is this. How much magnification do you want? Well, you have to be really careful with this one because typically what everybody wants to do is they wanna use the highest magnification they can get. But there's a problem in that. And the problem is, the greater you magnify, the worse your image becomes. So as magnification goes up, clarity or resolution goes down. So your best clarity comes with the lowest power of magnification. Now, you might think that magnification is the be all and end all of the telescope. After all, what do you have a telescope for? To magnify things, right? But trust me, I've been in this business for a long time. And what I've learned is that the higher I magnify an object, 
the less appealing it looks. It just doesn't look as good. Yes, I might have it magnified a lot, but it just doesn't have the clarity and sharpness I want a telescope to have. So you want lower power eyepieces to start with. How do you figure that out? It's very simple. These eyepieces all have a number on them. I'm gonna see if I can show you this number here. If you notice, right on the side of this eyepiece, that number right there, 25, that refers to what's called the focal length of the eyepiece, the focal length of the eyepiece. That number 25 tells me that the focal length of this eyepiece is 25 millimeters. Now, that's a medium-sized number. If I wanted higher power, I would look for a number that's lower than this, say maybe 12 or seven. Now, seven is very high magnification. But if I go up to 40, I'll get even lower, I'll get lower magnification. And that lower magnification will give me a nicer, crisper view of what I wanna see. So you always wanna start out with an eyepiece that's either 40 or 25. And after you become experienced, then you wanna to go to the higher numbers like 12 or even seven. Now, let me warn you, the other thing that happens, the higher the magnification, the smaller your field of view. So with an eyepiece with a number like 25, your field of view is wide, but with a number like seven, your field of view is tiny. Now, the problem with that is that it makes it very difficult to find things in the sky if your field of view is very tiny, is really tiny. It's very hard to find things. You always make out better if you have a wider field of view to find things in the sky. That brings us now to the second most important part of the telescope that helps you find things in the sky. And that's this little piece right here. This tiny little piece right here. This is the finder scope. I'm gonna bring it over so you can see it a little closer. Okay, now, this device that sits right on top of the telescope allows you to accurately aim and point the telescope at what you wanna see. This is like a small telescope itself, low power, wide field, low power magnification, very wide field of view. Now in this particular instance, let me see if I can show this to you. In this particular instance, here's what it looks like on the front end. It almost looks like a gun sight, sort of. And the way you would use this is you'd look through the back of this, through the front, and you would aim this on the telescope at what you wanna see. But first things first, this and this have to be aligned together. This has to see the same thing this does. I'll give you an example of how that might not work. Pardon me while I just sit this like this. Imagine my two hands represent the telescope and the finder scope. You want the two of them to be aligned together. If the finder scope points this way and the telescope points this way, then when you look through the finder scope at what you think you wanna see, the telescope's pointing over here. So they can't see the same thing. So you need the low power wide field to get you to the right spot so that you can use the high power field of the telescope. So you have to get these two aligned together. Now, the way you do that is really quite simple, but it's something that you do during the day. Here's how it works. You do this during the day outside. With your telescope on your mount, you point the telescope toward a distant treetop. The telescope, point that to a distant treetop and find that in the field of view of your eyepiece by adjusting the telescope to point in that direction. Once you get it there and you see it right in the center of your eyepiece, now what you do is you adjust the finder scope's direction to see the same thing right in the center of the field of view. You see what I've done? I've used the telescope to see the top of the object. Now I'm going to align the finder scope to see the same thing that the telescope does. 
Now, with the two properly aligned together, when you look through this one, then this is seeing the same thing. Very, very important. And here's the other thing. You have to do this during the day. You can't do it at night. Why not? Because you can't see anything at night. It's dark. So you need to do it during the day. First point this at the top of an object, then align this to see the same as the telescope. How do you do that alignment though? Let me show you how, to, how you do that. Let me see, ah yes, uh-huh. On this particular finder scope, it works like this. Let me show you how it works. So on this finder scope, we have a couple of different pieces. I'll point out to you what they are. First of all, right here, this dial is an on off switch. That's because this happens to be an illuminated finder scope. So if I turn this on, what it does is it creates a red dot that then shows up as I look through it and point this to the sky. Okay, right. Now, if I wanna adjust it, here's how I adjust it. The, I use the other two knobs that are here. So I have one knob here and I have one knob here. The knob up here in the front moves the finder scope left and right. So this one moves the finder scope left and right. This last knob back here adjusts up and down. So that's how I adjust this to see what this telescope sees. Left and right, up and down, okay? That's for this particular model of finder scope, all right? Now, the other thing I always have to remember about this finder scope is that once I'm done using it, I should turn it off or else my battery will run down. It's a common everyday battery, but doesn't it always turn out that uh, when you need to use it, it's run out of power because you left it on from before. So I'm gonna put the two back here now. And lock it in place. There's one last piece we have to go over on the telescope tube itself. And that's focus. How do you focus this telescope? Well, you focus the telescope by adjusting the distance between the main lens and the eyepiece. And what does that for you is this set of knobs right here at the bottom. See how the tube moves in and out? This is how you adjust the focus. The best way to do it is to find a bright object, point the telescope toward the bright object, look through the eyepiece, and then move the knob back and forth until you can get the object in focus. It's that simple. So that's all there is to the tube of any refracting telescope. What I've shown you here is what you'll find on every refracting telescope. Every refracting telescope has a main lens. Every refracting telescope has the focusing rack here. Every refracting telescope has the eyepiece. It may not have a diagonal, but it certainly has the eyepiece and they all work the same way. Every refracting telescope, almost everyone, has a finder scope of some sort. And that's it for the telescope tube. So if you understand those parts, you can get any refracting telescope tube to work for you. Now, often people might say, do I need to clean the lens on my refracting telescope? You should be really careful about that. You should be really careful about cleaning it. If you use your uh, tube cover, that works out better for you to keep the lens from getting dirty than trying to wipe it clean yourself, okay? All right, now let's go on because there's some other parts and pieces here that we need to do. And we also wanna talk about the reflecting telescope too. All right, here we go. So in this particular instance, we have a tripod here that holds the telescope up. And the tripod is really important because you need a stable mount for the telescope. That's what you really need is a stable mount to hold it so that it will provide you with a stable view. And a telescope mount like this works really well for this. In this particular instance, it's been built so that it is nice and stable, okay? So remember, in your telescope, you need to have the mount stable. If for any reason, it seems a little shaky, one of the things that you can do to help stabilize it is to hang a weight from the center of the tripod down below the center. So for example, you could take a one gallon plastic jug, fill it with water, 
put the top on good and tight, and then take a string, wrap it around the handle of the jug, and then tie the other end of the string across through the middle of the telescope mount, and that extra mass will help to stabilize the telescope. Okay? Not bad. All right, now, here's probably the most challenging part of any of these telescopes. It's the hand controller. The hand control is probably the most challenging. Here's what I'm gonna do for you just so you can see how this works. I'm gonna turn this telescope around. Just a moment. Let me grab this telescope like this. And I'm just gonna turn it around like this. And the reason why I'm gonna turn it around like this is just so you can see where all of this attaches. So modern telescopes nowadays have hand controllers that allow you to operate the telescope easily, okay? You can see that it's on a coil of wire that plugs into the side of the scope here. And you see my little red dot over here? Well, that indicates that I have power coming to the telescope. I have power coming to the telescope. Now, in this case, I'm using AC power because I'm here in the house, so I can plug it right in. But if I were outside in the field, I could do two things. This particular telescope uses double A batteries. It uses eight of them. Eight double A batteries fit in the center console here, and that will power this telescope and the hand controller. Fabulous. Not. Why? Because it's eight double A batteries. And guess what? What I've found is that every third time I go out to use the telescope, I need eight more double A batteries. Ooh, could I use rechargeables? Yes, I could use rechargeables. But actually, sometimes manufacturers have a battery that they use or that they manufacture that works with that. And I have one parked right over here that I'm using with this scope, and I'll show you that in a moment. But let's get to this because this is really important. This device has in it somewhere around 150,000 objects in the hand controller. So you could. You can use this, just like a television remote control, to drive the telescope around. And so this is called a go-to telescope. Go-to meaning you press a button and the telescope will go to the object you want to see. So I'm going to set this up right now to go to Mars, okay? Let's see if I can do this in reverse. I think I can, I think I can make this happen. Uh, okay, here we go. I'm gonna see if I can actually do this. So I have a series of instructions here. Just a moment, I'm gonna to have to come a little bit closer so you can see, see what I'm doing here. Okay, so I have a window up here that tells me what I'm gonna do and it tells me how to operate the buttons to do what I wanna do. So the first thing it tells me that I wanna do is it says press enter to begin my telescope alignment method. So I'm gonna press enter here and it says sky align, and I have a number of options. Now, over here in the far corner, there's an up down button, and that refers to my up down numbers right here. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna select, of all of these, I'm gonna select solar system align. Now that's the one I want, so I'm gonna press enter. And that's gonna ask me some questions. Hey, are you in Philadelphia? Yes, I am. Uh, is Venus the planet I wanna look for? No, it isn't. So I'm gonna use my up down buttons to get me to Mars. Ah, there it is. So now what it's gonna do is it's gonna say, center Mars in the finder scope using my major buttons right here. So watch what happens when I press a button. Watch the telescope. Ah, I'm moving the telescope now. So now what I would be doing is I would be using the hand controller, eyeballing where Mars is in the sky. Now let's say that I think that's where Mars is. Okay, now look, I'm cheating. I'm in the house, I'm not outside. I'm just ballparking it so you can see how it works, okay? So now that I've done that, I'm going to center Mars. And as I center Mars now, wait, let me get this. Here we go, right there. I'm gonna press enter. Now I'm gonna do a fine alignment, which means I now look through the main eyepiece and center the object with a smaller motor motion 
to make sure I have it exactly centered. Now I press the align button and it tells me, oh, align success. But this one also tells me to turn off my star pointer, which again is my control over here on my finder scope. Okay, so now it's ready. It says next star SLT. This means that the telescope is now ready for me to use it to go hunt up other objects. So let's go hunt another object. Let's hunt up a bright star. Let's look for Betelgeuse, okay? So now, how do I do that? I come down here to the star list button. I press the star list button and I'm gonna check and see, oh, wait a minute, I'm sorry. I did the wrong thing. I'm going to just undo this so I can get back to where I started. And I'm gonna press my list button, okay? Now this is gonna give me a list of different catalogs that I can look through. There's the solar system, there's a sky tour, there's variable stars, ooh, asterisms, called well, no, constellations, double stars, Messier objects, named objects, that's what I want. So let's see, which named object do I want? Well, the named object I want actually is a bright star, named stars. And I want the star Betelgeuse. So now I'm gonna go through the list until I get to the Bs for Betelgeuse. You may not be able to see this, but I'm going through the list of A stars and I'm gonna press and hold the button until I get down to the B stars. Oh, there it is, Betelgeuse. Now, theoretically what should happen is when I press the enter button, this telescope is going to go to Betelgeuse. Now I know that Betelgeuse isn't very far from Mars. So this telescope now should move itself around in that direction. You ready? Here we go. Oh, it's just gonna come down to it. Ah. Little bit of adjustment. And now my hand controller is gonna tell me when it gets there. And there's a little spinny thing in the top corner there. And when that little spinny thing stops spinning, that means the telescope is where it thinks it ought to be. All I have to do now is just go look through the eyepiece and that's where Betelgeuse should be. So that's a very simple and quick run through for how I can use this to go to different objects. Now, for example, if I thought I wanted to go see Regulus in the constellation Leo, here's what I would do. And I know that since I'm looking over here, Leo was way over there. Here's what I would do. I'd go down on the list until I come to the L's. I'm in the K's now. Whoop. I passed it. Let me go. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going down to the R's for Regulus. Oh, there it is. Regulus. Brightest star in the constellation Leo. Now I'm going to press enter, and it really should go over to that side of the sky. Ready? Here we go. Okay, there it goes. Uh, maybe I overestimated where it should be going to. All right, so I didn't have everything exactly aligned, but you get the idea of what's supposed to happen, right? Okay, good. Well, that's basically how this telescope works. Now, if I get into a situation like this and I'd like to correct it, all I have to do is press the undo button. I go back to the main menu and then I have control of the buttons so that I can make the telescope go wherever I want it to go. So see, all I'm doing now is just using the big buttons to point this around. Okay, so that's enough for that telescope. We can see basically how that works. And now we're gonna move on to the reflecting telescope. Not too much different, but let's take some questions now. Since we talked about the refractor, what questions do we have, Linda? Well, we have a shout out from Cass Becker from Illinois. Oh, hi Cass, thanks for joining us tonight. And Great to have Cass you aboard. Has a Bushnell 565. She says, maybe time for an upgrade? Oh yes, I think it could be time for an upgrade because nowadays these telescopes all have these motor drive systems and these go-to systems that allow you to find so many objects in the night sky with just the push of a button. 
So uh, go online. There's a couple of places you can go to check out what the new telescopes are like, and you'll probably find something that'll work for you. All right, a great shout out from Tonisha Brown. She says, you are a great astronomer. Thanks for sharing your knowledge of astronomy with us. We appreciate the great work that you are doing at the Franklin Institute. Hi, Tonisha. Thanks a lot. I really appreciate the shout out. Hopefully you'll get out and look at the night skies where you live. Randy Johnson, good evening. This is my first time here. This is very interesting. Where's a good place to purchase a telescope? Hi, Brandy. Thanks for joining us. I'll bet everybody has that question. Where's a good place to buy a telescope? A good place to buy a telescope is a place where you're comfortable with the store itself, with the people that are there and the information that, are, that they're giving you. But you may not be able to find a place easily. So if you just go online and Google you know, retail telescopes in your area, you may find a store that has one. However, let me give you this bit, this hint. I'd recommend that you go online to a place at the website telescope.com. Not telescopes, telescope.com. At telescope.com, you'll find the Orion Telescope Center. Now, I use Orion Telescope Center a lot because they have a lot of great equipment. The people there are really wonderful, and they ship really quickly when they have stuff in stock, which is most of the time. Now, during the pandemic, they've had some slowdowns like everybody else has, but they have all kinds of telescopes, every kind of accessory you could want, and the prices are really reasonable. I've used their material a lot. Now, you don't have to buy from them. You really don't. But just go there to see what's available on the market, and then you can decide what you want to do and where you want to purchase from. If you have a local shop, try to purchase from your local shop, but at least use telescope.com to help get you familiar with what's out there and what's available. That's my recommendation for that. What's another question, Linda? Cheryl Stett says she's learning so much tonight and she thinks you better upgrade the 50-year-old Tasco she has <laughs> with the shaky finder scope, LOL. Oh yes, yeah, Cheryl, I think you need a new telescope. You have a shaky finder scope. You're never gonna see a thing with that telescope. Well, maybe you could rehabilitate it, but you know, the new telescopes have other advantages besides just the go-to options. The lenses are much better made these days. Uh, the tripods are much more stable. The coatings that are used on the lenses are much better. All those sorts of things uh, might be a better advantage for you to find another telescope you'd like to buy. One more question. One more, okay. Betty Ann Clark says she lives in Kona and she sees whales and stars. Can she use the same telescope? Hi, Betty Ann, you're in Kona, a wonderful place. I've been to Kona, Linda and I have been to Kona before, we love it there. In fact, I know somebody who lives not too far from you down in Honau now. How's that, huh? See, don't I know the place? Now, can you use the telescope that you use to watch whales and birds to watch the night sky? Yes, you absolutely can. So don't be afraid to try it. My best recommendation for you is to start out with bright things like the moon and bright stars. And for everybody else who was with us learning about how the refractor telescope works, start out with the moon, start out with the bright stuff, then work your way on to the dimmer things. But yes, you can use your finder or your sighter, your, uh, your, uh, 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 your sighting scope, you know, your bird watching scope or your whale watching scope. You can use that for looking at the night sky too. So start out, first with the moon, and that'll work out better. Hope to see you in Kona sometime. Okay, thanks. All right, so folks, uh, we need to talk a little bit about the reflecting telescope. So let's get that done, and then we'll take more questions, okay? All right, so let me move on to this telescope. Now, you may have seen me use a telescope like this before, or talk about a telescope like this before. This telescope is essentially the same thing as a refracting telescope. But here's what I'm going to help you understand about this telescope. Now, this telescope, instead of using a lens, uses a mirror. And I'm going to see if I can get you to see the mirror. So the mirror is right down here at the bottom of the tube, right down here. It's right down here at the bottom of the tube. Maybe you can see a piece of it. Hold on, it'll come back in just a second. Hey, there we go. OK, the mirror is right down here at the bottom of the tube. Can you see it down there? Okay, so what happens in a telescope like this, in any reflecting telescope, light comes in from an object, 
hits the mirror at the back. The mirror, by the way, is all the way back here at the back end. I'll turn it this way so you can see. The mirror is back here. Light comes in this way, hits the mirror in the back. Then what happens is because that mirror is curved somewhat like a spoon, the light reflects up to another mirror behind this circle right here, right? Now, down the tube, there's a hole in the back mirror. The light goes down through that tube and comes out through the eyepiece on this end. Here's the eyepiece down here. So let's trace that light path again. Down, back up, down again, and out the eyepiece, okay? Down, back up, back down, and out the eyepiece here. And here's where you look. So essentially what this telescope has done is it's taken this length, hold it, it's taken this length and it's folded it like this. And in folding it like that, it's made the telescope shorter. Okay, that's great. Now in this case, this is also a bigger telescope. What do I mean when I say bigger? What I mean when I say bigger is that the mirror in this telescope is eight inches in diameter, eight inches in diameter, about this big. The lens in this telescope is only about this big. So this telescope gathers much more light, which means you can see dimmer, more distant objects. But it essentially works the same way, okay? How do I mean? Very simple. Here at the top of the telescope is the finder scope. Just like you have a finder scope on this one, this finder scope has to work the same way. It has to be aligned with the main telescope. So if you want to align the two, again, aligning so that they're both pointing toward the same thing, take the telescope out during the day, using a low power eyepiece, which you know all about now, point the telescope manually at an object that you can see at a distance, the top of a distant tree. Focus on that and then adjust your finder scope so it sees the same as the main telescope. Now, how do you do that alignment on this? Very simple. I will show you, it won't take but a minute. There's an adjustment screw here and an adjustment screw here. These two adjustment screws allow you to adjust the position of the finder scope up and down, left and right, so that it sees the same thing as the main telescope. Once you have these two aligned, when you go outside, the way you're going to use this telescope is you will find the object first with the finder scope, then view it through the main eyepiece of the big telescope. That's it. I know you're wondering, where's the mystery in this? Isn't this complicated somehow? No, it isn't complicated really. It's actually quite simple. Very simple optics using the finder scope first to give you low power and wide field. And then the main eyepiece gives you the high power you may be looking for. Now, just as I said with the other telescope, in this telescope, the eyepiece magnification is measured by the number on the eyepiece. So that number 25 tells you that this is a low power eyepiece or I'm sorry, a mid-power eyepiece. Let me come around this side so I can keep my wire straight. This is a mid-power eyepiece. I can use a higher power eyepiece if I want. And I have a diagonal on this, just like I had on the other telescope. And it also uses these little thumb screws to hold it in place. Now, one thing that may have happened on your telescope is you've lost these little thumb screws. You can find those little thumb screws at hardware stores that'll fit your telescope and then you can have everything back together working the way you want it to work, okay? Now, let's just talk about the rest of the telescope because the tube here is really very simple, just like this tube here, very simple, okay? Now, let's talk about how this telescope works. This telescope rotates around two axes. One is this rotational axis here, and the other is this rotational axis here, okay? In telescope terms, I have to give you some terms. This term is called azimuth. 
A-Z-I-M-U-T-H, azimuth, and that's the measure in degrees around the horizon from zero to 180, right? And last is altitude. Altitude is this measure from zero plus in altitude to 90, or zero minus in altitude to negative 90, okay? That's your altitude. Now, in this particular instance, altitude is measured from the horizon going all the way up to 90 degrees, okay? And the combination between this motion and this motion gets you anywhere around the sky. All right, now, how do you use this telescope? How do you actually operate this telescope? Now, in this instance, I was using a power supply from the house, but if I were to take this telescope out in the field, I'd use a battery. So here's a battery that allows me to take this telescope anywhere I want to use it. So it has all the power I need for several weeks of observing, actually, if I'm careful about how to use it. But I'm gonna turn it on so we can use it now. I'll hit the power switch here. You can see I have a green light here that shows me I have power. I'm gonna set it right over here on my shelf. I have a hand controller for this telescope, just like I had for the other. This is common, by the way, among any of these telescopes like this. They all work the same way. I plug my power supply in using my cord right here. I'm gonna turn it on, come back around this way so that I don't get tied up in my wires. Now, just like I did on this telescope, I'm gonna do the same thing on this telescope. So, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna set this telescope up so that it's pointing approximately to the south. Now I'm gonna follow the same procedure. Here we go. I'm gonna press enter to begin my alignment, okay? Press enter to get started. Again, I'm gonna choose the alignment that lets me look for the one planet I can see, all right? So I'm gonna use my down button to select Solar system alignment. Again, this is common among all these telescopes that work this way. I'll hit enter to use this. Oh, it says I'm in Philadelphia. That's great. The object I'm gonna use, I'm gonna look for is Mars. There it is. I'm gonna hit the enter button and it's gonna tell me that I should center Mars in my finder scope first. So here I go. I'm gonna center Mars in my finder scope first. And I'm going to do two at once. Now, I'm just going to estimate because, again, we're in the house, all that kind of stuff, right? Okay, here we go. Coming around, coming around, coming around. And I'm going to say that's where Mars is in my finder scope. So now I'm gonna hit the enter button. It's gonna tell me to align, which means I'm gonna more sharply, more precisely position the object in my main eyepiece right down here. So now the motors are moving, but they're moving much slower, okay? Okay, now let's say I've done that. I hit the align and it says, hey, great, you've got it. Now I'm gonna select the object I want. I'm gonna select, we're in, we know we're on Mars, so let's do the star again, Betelgeuse. So I'm gonna to go to my list. I'm gonna choose the named stars. Hit enter. I'm gonna search for Betelgeuse using the down arrow. I just went past it. There it is. Now that it's there, all I have to do is hit the enter button. And there it goes heading to Betelgeuse. You'll see it slows down. It thinks it's there. Again, I look for the little spinny thing in the top corner to stop spinning. Now, while that's happening, I've been doing this on these particular brand telescopes. Other telescopes have these same kind of features to, tell, to allow you to tell the telescope where to go. 
with a list of 150,000 or more objects that you can just pick from a list. So all you need to know are just a few bright stars or a few planets that you can see. And in that way, you can find your way through to so many objects in the night sky. Now, the cool thing about both of these telescopes is they're both portable. Obviously, this one is a little more easily portable than this one is. But if a couple of you are going, you can take a telescope like this out to some place where the sky is clear and dark. OK, now, in this instance, you're going to focus with this telescope. There's a small knob here on the back. And you'll twist this knob to focus the telescope, very much like you would twist the knob over there to focus the telescope. You'll twist this one. It has a nice, sturdy tripod. This is a really nice telescope that works really well. This is around the $2,000 price point, just under $2,000 price point, uh, maybe around $1,500 price point for a telescope like this. But a telescope of this size, an eight inch telescope of this type, might be all the telescope you'll ever need. Because if you can take it to a place where the sky is clear and dark, you can see almost anything you want. OK, so we've talked about this telescope, the refractor telescope. We've talked about the reflector telescope. We did most of our work here and then transferred over to here because it's pretty much the same thing, except we have mirrors rather than lenses. But let's see what other questions you have. Lots of them. Lynn Unruh says, is there a minimum strength you should look for? Is there a minimum strength you should look for in a telescope? Yes, this is about the minimum strength, a 60 millimeter lens. Now, when you're purchasing a telescope, don't purchase the telescope by the, man, by the magnification. That is not important. Do not purchase the telescope by magnification. You purchase the telescope by how big the lens is. So you buy as big a lens as you can afford. If a 60 millimeter is all you can afford, get that. That's the minimum, though, because this will allow you to see everything from the moon to planets to bright stars to nebulae under dark skies and still be portable. If you can afford something like this, go for it. What's next? Michael Singleton asks, what local stores in the Philly area to buy scopes from and what cost can you buy? Oh, my goodness. The question that Michael has is, is there a local store that you can go to? Yes. There is a store, Skies Unlimited in Pottstown. Skies Unlimited is a great place to go where you can actually see telescopes and talk to people who know what they're talking about. And as far as astronomy clubs in the Delaware Valley, oh my gosh, there are so many of them in Pennsylvania and even in South Jersey. If I were to try to go through the list, I might forget someone's name and I don't wanna do that because they're all friends of mine. But if you go online and look for astronomy clubs in this area, you'll find a list of all the astronomy clubs in this area. They are all fine people who do great work. They specialize in different topics. So you might wanna find one that's either close to you or specializes in something you're interested in. But these are great ways to get together with other people who have lots of different kinds of telescopes that you can have an opportunity to look through as you're deciding what type of telescope is best for you. And don't forget, Skies Unlimited in Pottstown. Tell them I sent you so I can get some discounts, okay? Please. What's next? Maria Algeris asks, what telescope is best for a beginner with a bad back? What telescope is best for a beginner with a bad back? Well, you know, you need something that's lightweight. So I recommend something like this. A 60 millimeter refractor doesn't weigh very much at all. Look at that. You can pick that up with one hand. And if I can pick it up with one, you can pick it up with two. And it, when you take it apart, it's very lightweight and transports really easily, but has all these features of the motor drive and the interchangeable eyepieces. So this is a great way to start, even if you have a bad back. Now, to help that bad back, get yourself an observing stool so you can sit comfortably while you look through the eyepiece. Don't forget that. What's next? Les Carreri just bought a Celestron 6 reflector with stock 25 millimeter eyepiece. Mm -hmm. The question is, if you could only add one more eyepiece, which one would you buy? Oh, that's a really great question, Les. If I could add one more eyepiece to the 25 millimeter, which one would that be? Les, I'd have to say I would go with a 17 millimeter eyepiece. Um, I don't think I would go as far as a 12 millimeter. You know what? I would. I'd go as far as a 12 and a half millimeter, but that's what I'd do. See, the 25 millimeter would cover the low power end. So I'd have wide field, 
good crisp views, but then I would go to a 12 and a half and that would give me the highest power magnification I want to use. Now, here's a guide for you all to remember. Magnification. You can magnify about 50 power per inch of aperture of your lens or mirror. 50 power per inch. So if you have a telescope that is 50 millimeters, then you can only uh, you know, uh, use that, that multiplication feature to help you figure out how much magnification you can do. So if you have two inches at 50 power, well then you can do, uh, you can do I'm sorry, 50 power per inch and two inches, you can do 100 power comfortably on your telescope, okay? All right, let's do one more question. We're getting down to the end here, folks. So, uh, and let me just say that if I don't get to your question here, I'll certainly respond to your question from the chat and answer you directly. Let's do one more. Paul McGuire says, what do you think about starting with binoculars? Paul McGuire says, what about starting with binoculars? Paul, that's a really great idea, especially for children. Start with binoculars before you decide on a telescope because you may not know what kind of telescope you want to use. So if you start with regular home binoculars, that's a great way to see the moon, to see planets, to see bright stars, and even to see some nebulae. The other thing I'll mention about that is that there are books available on the market that specifically cater to observing with binoculars. So astronomy with binoculars is a great and popular thing to do. You can start there. There are also books and guides that go directly to, say, like the 100 best objects you can see with a telescope of a certain size. So those kinds of guides will help you as well. Okay, folks, we've come to the end of our time here. We've done a tremendous amount. We went through a whole lot. We have your questions still in the chat. I will answer them directly. And if you have other questions, you can reach out to me through Twitter, at Cool Astronomer is where you can reach me. You can find my email address at the Franklin Institute. You can reach me there. I'm always happy to answer your questions for you. And next month, if you have more questions about your telescopes, please feel free to come back next month and ask your questions then too. We've done a lot. I don't want to oversaturate you, but I wanted to get you started on how you can get your brand new telescope or the telescope you've had in your closet. Get that out and start using it. And I want you to be comfortable with your telescope. It's not too complicated for you to use. You can do it. Remember, if you learn how to use any one of these telescopes well, you can operate any telescope anywhere. Yes, that's Right, you can use any telescope anywhere. Okay, so from the Franklin Institute, I'm Derek Pitts, the chief astronomer, your cool astronomer. Reach out to me through Twitter. Thanks for joining us here this evening for Night Skies at Home, our April 2021 edition. Don't forget, the Franklin Institute is open, so please come down and see us. We have great exhibits, including Crayola, the creativity exhibit. It's not about crayons, it's about everything else in creativity, and you really gotta see it. We're doing all the proper CDC protocols, keeping the place clean, and it's a great time for you to come visit us. So come visit us at the Franklin Institute, check out what we're doing. We still have planetarium shows going, all kinds of other things. We'll see you here next month. Night skies at the observatory. Don't forget, first Thursday night of the month at 7.45. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you again next time. My thanks to Joy, our technical director back in the studio over there, and my floor director here, Linda. Thanks, Linda. And thanks, everybody, for your great questions. Good night, everybody.